Helps to have a microphone, doesn't it? Turned on. Well, we have so many things to be thankful for this season, do we not? So many things. I am thankful for this congregation and for the talents that we have. Much love and gratitude to uh, Linda Scotto, our Children's Ministries Director, who... Uh, Just does a great job year-round for us, and to uh, all those who assisted her here, uh, much much love and appreciation to Bev Bell, our organist, who is so faithful to us all. Yeah. To Naomi, who helps with these programs year after year after year. Uh, to the guys who helped with this uh, production as a family and made it their project. <laughs> to our children, uh, beautiful and talented as they are. And uh, much love and appreciation to Bunny Thornburg, who continues year after year, decade after decade, to lead our, our choir. And we're always, talk to her, if you sing, she is interested in more than just a few voices. So that's, uh, and to our choir, of course, blessings to all of you who return those talents week after week. Uh, love and gratitude to Travis Johnson, who produces a beautiful bulletin for us. This year, uh, VJ did the designing of the bulletin, and so I want to thank her as well. I just visit another church, and you won't see anything like this. Every time I go somewhere, I say, yeah, we're doing a good job, because our bulletins are, are they're artful, they're lovely, they, they do indicate our care about not only beauty, but the God of beauty, and the way in which we take your being with us seriously. And so my thanks to VJ and to Travis. Uh, give a hand to our sound crew, please. <laughs> Birker and his team work tirelessly and faithfully behind the scenes, and I would have to yell a lot if uh, they weren't back there. So I'm really... It's, it's been a wonderful year, and I want to thank all of you for your help and participation. And as Milton mentioned, we do have a wonderful program Christmas Eve coming up at 11 p.m., and I would very much like to hear from you today or tomorrow by email if you're willing to do something with that program. Do a reading for us. If you have a, a Christmas uh, song that you have in your heart to share, we'd like to talk about that, too. So... Thank you so much. Um, it's been a rich season together in Advent, too. For those of you who are visiting, we here at Santa Clarita take Advent time to look forward to the coming of our God. This is a coming that is the first coming, but it also echoes the coming yet to be, the second coming, our unrealized eschatological peace, to, to put it in the big words, for those of you who, who appreciate me for that. Um, <laughs> it's our unrealized eschatology that we celebrate as well as our realized eschatology. And so Jesus has come, and yet we take Advent to look forward to that time of coming. And, and I just want to recap, for those of you who haven't been around, some of the fun and uh, beautiful things I think we've, we've been talking about. November 29, the sermon centered on gratitude. And I have to just recap for you that while that's particularly appropriate around Thanksgiving time, there is nothing you can cultivate in your life that will do more for you spiritually, psychologically, socially than a spirit of gratitude. A spirit of gratitude. I tell you what, there's always something wrong with everything, and those of us with sensitivities can see it, hear it, find it, smell it, whatever, instantly. We're very good at all of that, and that's a skill that's essential in our society. If we were to do what we, to, to do what we do, we need those people and those skills. But a sense, a deep abiding sense of gratitude for what God has done, for life itself, for this incredible planet we live on, what a thing to cultivate in your life, and it will change the way you relate to everything. 
a spirit of gratitude. And then December 6, we took a different look at Mary. You know, Catholics have a very different relationship by and large to Mary than Protestants do, particularly very different than Adventist Protestants do. And I wonder sometimes if in running from that a bit, the Mariolatry that we reject, I wonder sometimes if we don't miss the incredible woman that she was, tagged by God for this incredible purpose, but more importantly, raising a child whom she grew to follow. December we talked about, December 6, I guess it was, we talked about Jesus and his mother Mary and the way that she was not just a mother to him, but a disciple to him there at decisive moments along the way, even after his death, praying in the upper room, being with those who were uh, choosing the replacement disciple for Judas. She's present in all of these biblical moments. And so I took a moment to just say, let, let's reframe where we're coming from. Mary shows us not only what it means to hold God in her arms, but she shows us what it means to follow him as a disciple. We have a wonderful model of feminine discipleship in Mary. The following week, we looked at Zechariah's song. Zechariah was a high priest, the father of John the Baptist, and when the angel appeared to him and said that you and your wife are going to have a baby, because they were old, he thought it was funny. I guess you don't laugh at angels. Because when he laughed at the angel, the angel said, that's fine, you're not going to say a single thing until this child is born. And if you decide that his name is something other than John, you'll never say a single thing. You're going to be quiet until he's born and his name will be John and that's the end of the story. And so when the baby is born and this dumb man is given, this mute man is given a pad and pencil. Everybody is shocked when he writes his name is John because that was not a family name. This wasn't part of the tradition. He went against everything all the aunts and uncles and relatives and doting friends were telling them had to be the name. You're going to name him after your uncle Pete, right? It's going to be Pete. No, it's definitely got to be. No, his name will be John. Okay. And so Zachariah's song is what we, we focused on last week. Echoing back to songs of deliverance and songs of praise and songs that go back to Abrahamic sort of promises that we would live in a land and, in, and we would live in peace and inherit it. So Zechariah's song spoke to us last week, and now this week we're going to look at John the Baptist's song. And I know you're going to say to me, did John the Baptist sing? I don't know. I'm going to say like an angel. But this man did something that's really unique, and he models in his own discipleship something that I think we're not familiar with but need to become aware of. In ancient Near Eastern times, when a king traveled somewhere, generally two things happened. The richer the country, the bigger the country, the more powerful the empire, the more this was the case. But always an emissary was sent before the king to wherever he needed to go. An entourage was sent ahead of him. These emissaries would take gifts, messages from the king, and make arrangements for his travel and arrival. Now remember, we're not talking about um, secret surface and 747s here. We're talking about camels and and distances to lands that would take months sometimes to navigate. But I think what we forget in modern times is there was empire in biblical time. I mean empire with a capital E. And in the time of Rome, Rome was very, we're patterned after Rome by the way, but Rome was very deliberate about building roads. What do they say, the old saying? All roads lead to Rome. It's true. They built them like, like spokes of a bicycle wheel going to all parts of the world. 
Why? Because they wanted to be able to demonstrate that if there was an insurrection or there was somebody who didn't want to pay their taxes or there was an uprising in some different area of their empire, they could mar march an entire platoon of an army 20-some, 30-some miles a day toward that destination. And in biblical times, that's the equivalent of loading a tank onto a Galaxy 5 and sending it to Iraq. Unbelievable military power that they demonstrated in their capacity to move armies and people and supplies because of the roads they built everywhere they went. They built aqueducts so they would have water. They did all of this in the name of empire. But while Roman Empire may have been one of the greatest ones, there were lots of empires before them. The Egyptians, as you know, had an incredible civilization. The Assyrians. These, all these empires would have kings. And we, we think of these things as sort of primitive and crude, and yet we do almost exactly today what they did then, just in a different form. They would send a group of people, as I mentioned already, to the place they wanted to go. So let's say that the king of um, the Hittite Empire wanted to go visit Egypt. There would be a whole group of people that would be sent as an advance party to Egypt, first of all to make contact and make sure that everything would be well and that their king would be welcomed, but also to make sure that there were safe and proper accommodations, that the details were worked out of the visit so that there wouldn't be any friction between the group coming in and, and uh, the country being visited. There was concern, of course, because they would bring chariots and they would be bringing armed men, that it wasn't perceived as an attack or a, a battle coming uh, to, to the borders. A way was prepared for the king. The other thing that happened in, in ancient Near Eastern times was that if the road wasn't in very good condition, it wouldn't do for the king to be bouncing all over. Now, it's slow traveling, but if you're riding on something without springs in the axle, any little bump is pretty rough. And any rut could send somebody flying right out of a chariot. And so what would happen is these... Kings would send crews ahead of them to, to clean up the roads, so to speak. So when Isaiah speaks of every valley being made elevated and every mountain being brought down and the way being made plain, he's actually talking about two things simultaneously. And we'll, the subtlety will not be lost on you. One, he's making a reference to preparations for the coming of a king. The second thing he's making reference to is, of course, the, the spiritual message of this. What did Jesus say in his own ministry about valleys and mountains? In other words, what did he say about the proud and the humble? What did he say about the meek and the strong? What did he say about the oppressed and the oppressor? What did he say about justice? So implied in all of this is a deeply spiritual message that says those who have been oppressed are going to cease from being oppressed. Those who have been doing un unjust, injustice will become as the oppressed. You know, remember the Beatitudes. Jesus speaks in the Mathen and Lucan account, Lucan account, differently. One account emphasizes the literalness, that is to say, literally blessed are the poor, literally blessed are the poor and the, the, the meek, and so forth. The other account spiritualizes it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, etc. Both of these interpretations of Jesus' followers and the writers of our Gospels come to us as something to think about this season. Because just as Isaiah talks about preparing the way, and let's just look at that text so that we have it all together. Isaiah 40. Take a moment, open the word, Isaiah 40.
For those of you who were with us last Saturday afternoon, you might have heard some of these words. uh, Comfort, comfort ye my people. Says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. And then it goes to the prophetic. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. There is a king coming. And the way must be made. There's a king coming and the roads must be prepared. Now, wilderness here, of course, doesn't just refer to like the Sahara with sand dunes. It's talking about places not inhabited, wild places. And so if we take that that model of wilderness in the uninhabited places, in the desolate places, in the remote places, we make straight a highway for God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill made low. Rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And then what happens? What happens next? And the glory of God, the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. And then to seal it, as if God were taking a signet ring and shoving it into some clay, as if God were signing his name to it. This this prophecy, he says, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. When I hear those words, I can't help but smile. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Is there a higher authority? Is there a greater truth? Is there any deeper level of integrity or honesty than we might find in the Lord? It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate signature, the ultimate stamp of authority for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. There is such power in this mouth This is the mouth that speaks and things become. This is the mouth out of which creation is born. This is the mouth that speaks words of judgment and they are so, and works of forgiveness, words of forgiveness, and it is so. This is the mouth that brings to us a word that endures. The word of God is forever. Well, then we can go too to Luke, and we find John the Baptist's song there. As it was written in the books, book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, what we just read is found right there in its entirety. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way. Now listen to John chapter, I mean Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Etruria, and Traconitus, excuse me, Traconitus, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. All that detail just helps us with perfect precision and the help of archaeology place exactly when and where these things took place. We have multiple different entities and calendars coming together in one list of names. So thank God for that little introduction to this time in John the Baptist's ministry. It's been enormously helpful. And so from that, we have very precise date for when all of this was taking place. Now, we oh, we, we, we give uh, credence to this sentence a lot, but I don't know if we think about it in terms of preparing the way. 
John the Baptist is preaching a gospel for the repentance of sins. Now, I'm going to try to be brief about this. Up till now, if you wanted to become a Jew, you had to be baptized, the mikvah. Conversion to Judaism required circumcision for the men and baptism in the mikvah by which you became born a Jew. And God had chosen this people. But John the Baptist is now shifting this to something different and something new. Salvation doesn't depend at this juncture on belonging to a special group of people. Salvation is no longer for those who call themselves children of Abraham. It's broader than that. John the Baptist is preaching a baptism, that is to say the birth into a new identity, for the forgiveness of sins. John said to the crowds, verse 7, coming out to be baptized to him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We know where Jesus gets some of his message as well. It's the Elijah message. John the Baptist is preaching this repentance for the forgiveness of sins and baptism into a new order of things. This is a new order of God's reign and God's justice. The two are inseparable. This is why Isaiah is speaking and John the Baptist is speaking of valleys being made mountains and hills being made Lo, a new era is coming, a new kind of king, a king who brings with him a new order, a new way, a new sense of belonging. How do I know that this is true? And I'm not just telling you this because it's my sort of axe to grind, if you will. Read on with me, John, uh, Luke 11. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? And he said, be just. Don't collect any more than you're, in, you're required to. And then some soldiers said to him, what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and all were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is coming more powerful than I. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. One is coming who will not just cleanse you from your sins, but enliven you with spirit. One is coming who will make judgment upon the earth. This is a realized eschatology, and it's an anticipated eschatology. It's a realized coming of Jesus that we've been looking for in Advent, and it's an anticipated coming of Jesus that we look for at the second coming. Let's leave it at this. John the Baptist's song is about making way for a Savior. And it's about ushering in a different kind of kingdom. And in all of that unfamiliar language, I just invite you as 21st century American people gathered in Southern California, Santa Clarita, 2,000 years after these words were stated and more, I invite you to ask what preparing the way of the Lord looks like for you. What do you need to be doing to prepare the way of the Lord? How are you an emissary? In what ways are you making mountains valleys and valleys mountains? How are you living out this call of John the Baptist and Jesus? 
that if you have two shirts, you can give to one who has none, and if you have food, to share it. A different kind of order. A different kind of kingdom. A different kind of Savior. A king. Let's prepare the way. Thank you.